Thanks. Our next speaker uh, and final speaker for this session is Hana Kugana, um, who will give a, a paper entitled, Why do you want to go to Cainta? Searching for sepoys against the archival crane, uh, archival grain. Um, just a few, just an introduction of Hana. Uh, she um, received her PhD at University College London here down the road uh, and is lecturer in global history at the University of Sussex. Her research broadly engages with histories of empire, eth ethnogenesis, and global civil society and post-colonial approaches to heritage and commemoration in the context of Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Her work has most recently appeared in Tupaya, Captain Cook, and the Voyage of the um, Endeavor, a material history uh, in 2022, very recent. And she's currently writing a monograph about nation building and third worldism through the lens of Philippine educational publishing. So let's welcome Hana Kugana. Bear with me while I figure out the technology. It's always a bit different. It'll be all right. Just sit there. This is about sharing the screen, right? That's the, the fatal sure mistake. The, make sure it's the right screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like after how many years of online teaching, I should be very good at this. <laughs> Not always. Brilliant. I think I've got it. Great. Okay, actually, I'm just gonna, is that, that water, is that the right to? Yeah. Okay. Just realize I'm getting hoarse all of a sudden. Drank too much sugar. Oops, okay. And now I've just spilled water all over myself. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, right, so uh, my name is Dr. Hana Kugana. Um, I've already been introduced, but I'll introduce myself again. Uh, lecturer in global history at the University of Sussex. Um, and yeah, obviously, thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to the organizers, the Christinas. And uh, thanks to SOAS and Princeton for putting on a, a really wonderful program uh, and welcoming, a, a, and in some ways, a, a kind of um, interloper today seeing as most of my research is on 20th century Philippines. So that's definitely the um, perspective that I'm uh, bringing here. Uh, and though I have done previous uh, research in early modern um, archives, pr predominantly um, Dutch archives. So, uh, and I'm not really talking about Dutch archives and talking about the British East India um, Company archives a little bit here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that we could maybe talk more about later in thinking about the uh, special issue. Right. So um, context, context, context. Uh, so the life of this paper began in February, 2018, before the pandemic, um, before I started at Sussex uh, and well, before my baby, so I've had a baby. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was actually not intending to be doing any research on sepoys or anything that's being discussed here today. Um, I was going uh, to, well, I'm clicking the, and it's not working, okay. Yeah, so I was actually going to research, uh, do some more research on the book that I'm working on, which is on uh, educational publishing, um, particularly the Abiba Publishing House. If you're from the Philippines, you would have probably uh, studied a lot through Abiba textbooks, uh, but no one's ever really written a history of uh, this company and still family owned. So they have amazing archival research, uh, archival um, repositories. And obviously the, um, the children of the founders are still alive. So great to interview them. Um, so I'm dealing mainly with their archives in Quezon City, uh, but also the Philippine National University. Uh, and th this all makes sense, by the way, I'm just context framing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at Philippine Normal University uh, records because they, uh, the founders of this publishing house are both educated there. Um, they're kind of part of this new American colonial uh, middle class. Uh, and they were sent out into uh, local barangay and communities to go teach, you know, preach the, the American imperial gospel. Uh, but that's not at least what I argue, what I argue 
it, that didn't happen. But actually in their textbooks, um, you definitely find moments of resistance. Um, and so I'm very interested in that kind of hidden transcripts, that kind of hidden resistance in those archives. Uh, but as a result, I'm also interested in kind of how do they pitch Philippine history, um, particularly post-1945 when the Philippines is independent. Now, how do they talk about Diego Silang um, in their textbooks? I mentioned this to Christy that you know, he has a, a kind of part in these school textbooks, uh, but not in um, the context of uh, the Spanish empire, but in a kind of pan-Asianist revisionist history. So I'm interested in kind of how these early modern topics find their ways into uh, Philippine classrooms um, on a kind of more popular uh, level uh, and not necessarily top down. Um, so in some ways, this is kind of, um, I take a kind of public uh, history perspective as well. And so, uh, yeah, I'm also interested in kind of how Aviva texts are exporting Philippine nationalism and nation building um, mythologies to places in, say, the Middle East, where there's a large Philippine diaspora. Um, they have Philippine schools there. And um, once a year, uh, Middle Eastern, or these uh, Philippine schools in the Middle East come to buy their books from Aviva. So I've been talking to them about how, uh, when that started, and kind of more contemporary history of that. But anyway, so. Um, in 2018, in February, I'm bouncing around Manila. I'm going between Quezon City, um, Makati, um, Intramuros, uh, and you know, I always take an, uh, take every opportunity to see Abiva texts in local schools. And this is the context in which I encountered the Sepoys of Cainta. Um, so they have a school there, um, the Fel uh, Francisco B. Felix uh, Memorial High School, uh, and they uh, are on the list of Abiva um, supplies if you will. So I thought it was one of the schools that I, I thought I'd check out. Um, and part of it was just uh, you know, chance encounter, I would say. There's a lovely beep. Uh, my my nana, my mom is uh, was in Manila at the time, and you know when she says you come to luncheon with her, you go to luncheon, and that was in uh, Pasig. So she was seeing um, one of her med school friends from UP, and I was going to meet her for lunch and then go to the school afterwards. And uh, the impetus for this paper and really all of what follows um, is my nana's response to my plans. She said, no, why do you want to go to Cainta? And uh, you know, the contemporary context here, it's kind of a pinnacle moment in Duterte's, Rodrigo Duterte's uh, war on well, drugs or drug wars. And Cainta at the time was being mentioned in a lot of news briefs um, as having a lot of uh, drug war related incidents. Um, so you know, there is this kind of association of Cainta with this kind of uh, you know, crime. Um, and my mother grew up in Mandaluyong and had never really had a reason to go to Cainta. And so she was not sure if it was safe, and, but she knew me and she knew that I would would go anyway. So she said, I'm going to come with you. So she came with me to Cainta, to the school. Uh, we took a tricycle. It was fun. Um, <laughs> there she is. Um, and that's my mom in front of the school. All right. So we're in Cainta. We're on, at the school. And so I'm just going about my research. And she's like, don't mind me. I'm just going to hang out. I don't know why it's not going, but it'll go in a minute. Yes. So that's the facade of the school. Uh, and we were directed to the librarian once we got there. Um, they have a really nice library. Uh, but I was uh, talking to the librarians about uh, their engagement with Abiva. And then I noticed these, uh, you know, a wall full of trophies and I was like what's that and that's when the librarian's eyes lit up she said oh well, we have an award-winning school newspaper and um, by the way this is a secondary school this is a high school I just want to emphasize that um, and surprisingly the title of the local periodical it's like oh subways and you know having at this point I've lived in the UK for 11 years so I know who the subways are you know anything about British imperial history you know who the subways are um, but just for those of us who you know, aren't from here and aren't um, familiar with the subways beyond what's been said today um, you know defining subways the subway is a term that's uh, generally applied to people of South Asian descent who are in the employ of the British um, you know, imperial military uh, whether it's the company or um, actual kind of formal uh, British military depends on the time period, and there and Sepoy has a lot of connotations in a British historical context uh, that I wasn't so sure if any of these made it into this. Um, we might say appropriation of the term. And so I was just a bit curious, you know, why sepoys? This is all very strange. Um, is this a fluke? You know, is this kind of like what um, Americans do when they name their sports teams, the Braves, you know, uh, appropriating these indigenous terms? I, I just wanted to know more about it. 
Um, and so while we're very much aware of Cainta's, say, famous babinka and other coconut and rice desserts, you know, ladik, um, this still amorphous connection to British Indian subways is not something that was common knowledge to me uh, or even my mother who grew up not too far from here. Um, but quickly, a story was emerging of this place, Cainta, recast in the image of the subway. So I started, it wasn't just, uh, you know, the title and they just chose it for whatever reason. And I started to find news articles. Um, in, a, in a high school newspaper about the history of sepoys in Cainta. Uh, and the reasoning was to look back in the, looking back in the past is the best way to prepare for the future. So I was kind of intrigued what this history really had to do with um, Cainta's future, if at all. Oh yeah, I think, uh, good. Uh, Kika's is, yeah, apparently um, very famous in the Philippines for being very good at making Binka. Um, and this is a um, picture from Facebook, uh, from the Facebook page of this high school. You, know, you are not from Cainta if you don't know who this is. Anyone, like that That seems like a very strong uh, kind of claim. Can you imagine if you don't know who the stuff are and you're from Cainta? So anyway, so my interest is peaked and I was not at all looking for these sub but there, there they are, great. So, um, and this is not something that's new. Uh, they have had a school publication uh, entitled The Subway since at least the 80s, and the school was only founded in the 1970s, uh, 73. Uh, and so this is definitely like a kind of prolonged um, you know, engagement um, with uh, the idea of the subway. So this raises questions, who are uh, who were these subways that they're talking about in all of these news features? Uh, and why were these students and staff so eager to identify as subways? Uh, right, so I started looking into the periodicals that this librarian just started bringing out. Uh, and this is uh, the kind of protective casing on that first issue from 1980. And in there, they give uh, a kind of, you know, they answer that question or they, they yeah, they answered in their own way. So first of all, something that kind of struck me as strange is the subways were named after the boat people from India, uh, boat people from India, who migrated in Cainta in the early 16th century, and like the, the subways came a century later. So, so there is this kind of, you know, uh, anachronism, right? Uh, but the next part, they were described as tall, dark, and handsome with curly hair, <laughs> long and painted, aquiline nose with a black, deep-seated eyes. It's very racial, right? It's got this like racial discourse, which is kind of strange. Um, and it's something that we'll, I'll talk more about as we go along. Uh, and it's also, uh, there's also this kind of parallel here, with, or um, parallel publication, the Tagalog version, a uh, counterpart to the Sepoys, and that's Magdalatik, uh, which is a word that um, describes someone who makes sweets, so like Babinka. So in some ways, these two periodicals kind of um, parallel uh, two kinds of things that are associated with Kainta. Um, and they seem separate at this point, right? Um, food culture, food capitalism, race, um, but as I will talk about towards the end, that's not uh, necessarily the case. Um, so right, so we have this kind of anachronism. Uh, and then, so that's 1980s, 1990s, we have this one. Uh, again, we're starting off with this kind of racialization of the sepoys, right? Have you ever seen a dark skinned and semi kinky haired, uh, you know, with deep seated eyes and pointed nose people? Uh, well, if you visit Cainta, you can see for yourself. Um, and so there's this kind of the, the identity, uh, this association with the sepoys is very much a kind of strange racial one that we can't really place yet. Um, and uh, we've also had the introduction of kind of religious, uh, you know, kind of re religious affiliations of these sepoys. They're descendants of Hindu, so linked with Hinduism. Um, but if anybody's studied, uh, say, caste in India, you will know that uh, the British um, administration had a huge, um, say, influence on how, uh, you know, Hinduism um, was developed and in, um, kind of implemented through a caste system. I'm, you know, obviously, I'm not with um, uh, the author who says that caste, uh, Indian caste was invented by the British, but it would de was definitely majorly transformed in the 19th century. So anyway, so Hindu, we've got Hindu, we've got kind of religious connotations, caste um, implications as well. Um, and that somehow the sepoys, uh, you know, where the name is adopted because it's symbolic um, for all of the reasons I've kind of just mentioned. Uh, we've also got details about uh, the nature of uh, sepoy recruitment. So we're moving away from that boat people, 16th century version of things uh, that these sepoys were asked to join the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, asked, that seems like a euphemism in some ways, <laughs> considering recruitment practices that we've even heard about today. Uh, right, so we're starting to get a better sense of who these sepoys may or may not be. 
in the 2000s to uh, 2010s. Uh, now we also have uh, details. If you look at the we have text, I'll maybe um, maybe I should share this slide show. I don't know, uh, but in the text it. Uh, places a lot of emphasis on miscegenation, as if uh, the kind of important thing about these subways was that they assimilated into local communities. So we have that kind of, um, they didn't just come and settle, like say um, you know, a lot of Chinese uh, communities or groups uh, and keep to themselves, they integrated um, and therefore they are part of Kainta, they're part of uh, the society past and present. Uh, and we also have an association with race with vocation. So we have words like enterprising and merchants often associated with these sepoys and their descendants. Uh, and that is very much actually another anachronism. It seems more to be a product of later waves of migration from South Asia um, you know, after partition in particular. Um, and this is kind of the more popular understanding of say South Asians in general, not just people who are descendant from sepoys, but that gets kind of grafted onto these sepoys. Um, and for what ends. So again, there are, there are kind of huge discrepancies in the ways in which sepoys are understood um, here, like between here and um, kind of what we know from his, his geography, um, particularly on the British end, uh, but even within this kind of educational milieu. Um, you know, how do we tell sepoy fact from fiction? Uh, and a visit to the municipal archives then was in order. Fortunately, the municipal town hall uh, and historical records were just a short walk down an alleyway from the school, uh, so we went. And in those municipal archives, they do have sepoys mentioned in there. So this um, history of, uh, I guess, region, uh, district of Kainta, uh, it was produced in the 1980s, so martial law. Uh, period of martial law, something to, to flag. And this passage uh, relates to the sepoys uh, in particular. It's a passage talking about the legacies left by the British after the invasion and the occupation. Um, and in there, we have uh, some, again, kind of strange uh, legacies that they claim kind to, um, you know, still upholds today. Uh, and that's voting rights under British occupation. Kainta was occupied during uh, by the British during the occupation because it's very close to um, Intramuros. Uh, and so this author says that one of the things that people got used to in Kainta was having voting rights under the British occupation, which is not like democracy is not necessarily something that sticks out in my mind is something very um, poignant about that occupation. Uh, and then we also have a section here that talks about this um, moment as inspiration for further anti-colonial um, action against the Spanish. So if the British could, um, if the British could defeat the Spanish, then um, Filipinos could uh, do the same and cast out the Spanish. Uh, and so you know, I think both are anachronisms, like that language doesn't seem quite right if you look at the historical records, um, even on the British side, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and yeah, so this is something to think about that, that in some ways this is more, that the sepoys become a, a kind of premise to talk about contemporary political and social issues, uh, that in some ways they're more of um, edelons, right, um, kind of um, ways to project um, desires and, and objections to contemporary conditions. So something also striking was that someone had beat me there a few years ago, and they made it very clear to me I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the last name right. Um, he's the, he, he uh, yeah, so he was the Dean of the Asia Center at UP, University of the Philippines. Um, and he uh, contributed a chapter on the Indian community in the Philippines. Uh, and he, you know, it seems like a very good person to be writing about that having been from uh, India himself uh, and, and um, yeah, married a, a Filipino woman. And yeah, was at UP for a long time. And he says uh, in that chapter that he describes this, this um, Sepoy's set settlement in Kainta as a chance encounter. So that's kind of interesting uh, that it, it doesn't, uh, that it was of no historic uh, significance uh, to whom, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, and oops, 
Yeah, and he also adds another kind of motivation for why these sepoys settled in Kainta, uh, that they might have been the equivalent of POWs left behind as well as drifters. Uh, so that's already kind of in contrast to some of the language that's used to describe these sepoys, you know, that they refused to go back. Um, maybe they just were you know, forced to stay behind. So we have conflicting um, narratives for their remaining in the Philippines. Uh, also, they uh, let's see, lived on the charity and generosity of their British superiors. This has a lot to do with things that were talked about in some of the other papers talking about sepoys, um, that the, they, had, they only were entitled to half the bata that other, um, say, white officers, and when I say white officers, I'm not referring just to the British ones, but also the French, because there's a lot of French troops, right, in the occupation of Manila. Um, but they, so when they got there and their wages were paid in advance, that they had to find some way to feeding, feeding themselves. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, so let's see, how are we going with this? Yeah, and I think something similar goes for when they were actually uh, settled in Cainta, that the, they had to also, um, you know, live on the charity and generosity of local people. And I think this also explains why they assimilated into these local communities, not just like, oh, we want to assimilate necessarily, they had to, you know, to survive, you had to have, um, you know, collaborators, not collaborators, but, um, you know, people to help you survive in a place where you don't know the language, you don't know the politics, um, etc. Right, so aside from local and diasporic histories, you find sepoys in the margins of histories of Europe's various overseas uh, empires. Uh, scholars writing about uh, Manila sepoys um, after right uh, to give some examples include Megan C. Thomas, 2019 article about the military labor of the British occupation of Manila, uh, Claude Markovitz, uh, and writes about sepoys, um, Indian sepoys and the travels in the service of the East India Company, not just um, in the Philippines, but elsewhere. Um, and yeah, those are its important work. And so each of these archival constellations, uh, in a sense, represents a different approach to finding sepoys in the historical record uh, and a different way of understanding their significance, if at all, to different communities, past and present, uh, you know, through localized revisionist history, uh, Indian diasporic or a history of Indian migration to other parts of Asia, uh, and European colonial and particularly imperial military history. And so borrowing from Anne Laura Stoller, this is what reading along the archival grain could look like in the case of the sepoys. Uh, so I'm gonna just try to speed through this. My next part of call was the British uh, Library up here uh, by King's Cross. Um, and I think we, you know, the, this is a great source um, in the sense that one of the previous speakers was um, you know, talking about, is it, is it enough to think about these colonial archives as top down? And then we also have the alternative um, kind of um, archives from below. British East India archives are very much about uh, written by men on the spot. There's, they exist somewhere in between and they can assert their own agency in really interesting ways. Um, but through those um, archives, you can you know, trace numbers and names. Um, Christy Flannery has provided me some stuff from the Spanish side, so I'm hoping to kind of get into that at some point. Um, but I did do some digging into the British East India archives. Um, so yeah, so you can do a kind of numbers-based approach. Um, but also, um, there's lots of written accounts written for very, very different reasons. This particular account um, of the occupation of Manila uh, was written so someone could basically claim back their losses um, as a kind of ranking officer during the occupation. So it's a legal document in, in a really yeah, kind of weird way. Uh, and here it, you hear though, you can hear the sepoys kind of, um, you know, and see kind of their perspective a little bit. Um, and so, it was mentioned that they wanted to take um, troops to China um, and wait there until they had the proper means to get back to India. The British, when they left, didn't have enough ships for everyone. One of the reasons why some people had to stay behind. Um, but here it says that um, the sepoys who had engaged only for six months and had served uh, above 20 uh, swore by Muhammad. So not all Hindus, if some of them are swearing by Muhammad, right? Uh, Muslims as well, they would not be left behind to be cut to pieces by the Spaniards. The next part on the other page says um, they would oppose the embarking of English soldiers at the risk of their lives upon um, 
It's the beach, the beach. Um, so these guys didn't want to stay. You know, they didn't want to mutiny or, you know, they wanted to go home. And a lot of them had families there. You know, they had ties to South Asia. Also, there is the money incentive. They hadn't been paid since they got there. So you wouldn't be paid if you stayed and mutinied. So some of them were banking on that if they went back, they would get the full money um, that they were entitled to but the promise, right? Um, the other source is about the Pondicherry affair. Again, another kind of um, instance where you really see the British East India Ar uh, Company archives um, conveying a starkly contrasting version of events and, and of this, and accounts and portrayals of the subways um, from those of Kainta that I encountered in those school newspapers. Um, that being said, this does not mean Kainta's subways aren't real, nor the stories they tell about them untrue. Um, the stories Kain Daniels, tell about the subpoys, tell us um, who they are. Um, they are, again, edelons through which they convey um, socioeconomic, cultural commentary, and political critique in more recent times. I um, mean, you can't find these stories, uh, these subpoys, by reading along the grain. So I realized at some point that I was actually talking about something completely different. Uh, reading against the grain uh, has meant returning to Kainta. Uh, and Kainta itself is a rich uh, public history archive. Um, here we have a monument um, to the Sepoys and the Maglalatiks. And uh, you have local um, people who are writing about this. So this is a blogger um, uh, and she's an artist and she's written this article called Steampunk Kainta on Sepoy at Maglalatik. And she says here that the only soothing thing in this now alien land, because um, Kainta has since been very heavily industrialized, um, I guess is the newly erected statue of Ang Sepoy um, Ad Mag Lalatik, um, um, it's in steampunk brass, still very in unison with the rusty mecca theme that the whole of Kainta hopefully will decide in the future not to go with. So um, the Sepoy has become embedded in a kind of anti-capitalist, uh, um, discourse rather than a historical one necessarily. It's not a commentary on history. Um, also, there are uh, festivals, popular festivals in Kainta that uh, also feature the subways. Um, and this is where it gets a little controversial. We get kind of a racist. Uh, and here, you know, we've got brown face and subway face. Um, and we're so used to seeing something like that and, and completely dismissing it. Um, but I think that race is far more complicated in 20th century Southeast Asia than West and the rest binaries allow. That you know, these people want to identify with the Sepoys, that even if it is misguided putting on brown face, that it has kind of local cultural significance um, beyond um, you know, kind of existing racial um, binaries. Um, so we can think of this paradoxically as a kind of, um, you know, genetic neo-imperialism because he, there's an immense colorism in Philippine society today, um, but it's also a complex celebration of uniqueness through a real or at least self-asserted identity. Um, this uh, picture of Sepoy descendants hangs in the municipal, municipal archives, and they're not actually in the archives, but they're on the wall. So I think that's kind of interesting, and we can use that as a source for telling the story um, of the Sepoys of Kainta as well. So yeah, and, and there's also so many pictures of, of Sepoy's uh, descendants um, and we, don't, we can't verify it. You know, people just look at them and say, oh, they look like they might be descended from Sepoy's. So it's not really about who is actually descended from Sepoy's, but it's just that idea that all Cayentenios are all Sepoy's and it's part of their kind of um, provincial identity now. So to conclude, sorry. Right. Um, so I think this portrait uh, is a good place to end. It hangs in the municipal town hall um, and it conveys parallel stories or histories in which subpoys um, are both invisible and up front and center. Now, nothing, there's no um, kind of historical representation of the subpoys in this painting. And yet the man at the center um, is the namesake of that high school that I started at, Francisco B. Felix. Um, and he is repeatedly descended from subpoys. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to go back and, and verify that. the sepoys. Uh, when you're sunk in thought, be sure not to indulge in fantasy. 
Uh, but we wouldn't have gotten to this point, or I wouldn't have gotten to this point uh, without indulging in a bit of fantasy. Uh, in some ways, I think this is an allegory for Philippine studies in the UK uh, more broadly. Uh, you know, we often study imperial history through national frameworks, um, and this creates blind spots. You know, I wouldn't be able to tell this history without thinking um, beyond um, you know, just Spanish colonial archives or British colonial archives. Like it really takes a kind of um, you know going in between and then walking in alleyways in Cainta to, to tell the story. So you know, following the Manila occupation subways in this, these ways against the grain defies these frameworks and helps us to see around these spots and see the dark matter of history itself. Um, and I'm reminded of Greg Denning's um, kind of uh, approach of writing history of the imagination. You know, indulging in fantasy is what got us here, uh, and it's what will get us further and jettison us into the stars of Benedict Anderson's political astronomy. So that's it. And there. Thanks. Thank you.